Mr. Beacon podcast is sponsored by Williot, scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth. Jacob, thanks very much for coming back on the Mr. Beacon podcast. I think this is our third conversation recorded, and uh, we've had a few more that haven't been recorded, which have been pretty cool as well. But um, this is a special occasion because this week you guys have a, a new product out. Um, and as a solution designer, I am really excited by it because it just it's like the Swiss Army knife of... Uh, of Beacon technology. So um, why don't you tell us a bit about, uh, at a high level, w what is it that you guys are launching this week? Absolutely. You know, thanks again uh, for having me. And, you know, I really enjoyed all, all the conversations we had about, you know, Be Beacons and, and Bluetooth and, and, and IoT. And, uh, you know, we've been um, into this business for the last, you know, five, six years. Uh, we've seen um, a lot of applications. And, you know, our main focus for them uh, for that time was the technology and the software to locate people. So we, we used um, standard beacons mm -hmm. and, um, and the kind of software that we embedded into mobile devices so we could compute the position of, of people. And um, what we understood over time is that, you know, the, the businesses in the physical world, they consist not only of smart location and walls and ceilings and people, but they're also key assets. There are some vehicles, there are some objects, there are, you know, depending on what the business is. And, and, um, and, and you know, locating people uh, was sort of simple because they had phones and that phone could run software and that phone was always connected to the cloud. But we sort of asked ourselves a question, you know, is that possible to design sort of like a phone but um, you know, without the screen, without the user interface elements, that would be you know similar price to beacons, and that could talk directly to the cloud, and also use the beacon infrastructure to locate these assets inside the buildings, but also use whatever is possible outside the building, like GPS, to to um, to, to report its position, and and this is you know how we you know ended up with. This device. All right. So it's um, <laughs> so it's um, we call it um, an LTE beacon. Um, it has three main radios. So it has a um, um, IoT LTE class radio. Uh, we can talk more. It's a it's a category M1 and narrowband um, radio. It of course it has Bluetooth, and it has also the GPS. So those three radios can be mixed together. Um, yeah, using software. So we enable software developers to build what we call IoT apps and um, through JavaScript, they can uh, decide you know, how they want to use this device. So if they want to program the device just to act as beacon, they can do it. This device can talk to the cloud, it can fetch the data, you know, advertise Eddystone or iBeacon. Mm -hmm. That could be one of the use cases. But what we're excited the most is that you know, this device can scan and can talk for the for the other Bluetooth beacons. It means that if you attach this to an asset, um, it can locate itself inside the building the same way we did that for um, for phones and people. Mm -hmm. But because it has GPS, you know, it can also uh, report the position of an asset when it's outdoor, and it can kind of automatically switch between indoor and outdoor. So, so we are extremely excited, and um, you're absolutely right. This this could be a Swiss Army knife for the IoT, mm -hmm. and we hope that um, the community will um, will you know appreciate it. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about all of the firsts that this represents for our ecosystem, and there's there's quite a few. You touched on a few of them, and we should uh, we should look into this. Um, uh, you've got GPS on the beacon. You've got a uh, essentially a 5G uh, radio, uh, so this can act as a gateway. You've got this level of programmability, um, and and so this is more than just a very simple piece of hardware. I'm sure people are wondering about how much this is going to cost. So so tell us how much this costs, and then let's talk about some of the use cases that you've been thinking about and you, where you think it's going to be applied. So first of all, how much does it cost? 
<laughs> yeah, so so we will be distributed um, that uh, that product as um, development kits. Those the same way we we used to distribute beacons. So anyone uh, can order um, a few dev kits and start playing, you know, immediately. So one dev kit will have uh, two devices, and it's going to be priced uh, one hundred twenty nine dollars uh, for two devices. And you know because um, this is a cloud device, so it can talk directly to the to the to the network. And you know we are using number of partners uh, globally. So um, you know in in the United States, uh, we're using partners that have already rolled out their uh, 5G ready uh, narrow band and LTEM infrastructure, and in Europe and Australia, Japan, and so on. So there will be also an addition um, a subscription plan, which will be uh, for that dev kit two dollars per month per the device. Mm-hmm. And within and within that fee, uh, there is um, there's a data plan. There's um, their cloud services. You know and everything that um, people would need to just start quickly prototype. And of course, um, um, this is the pricing for the development kits. And yeah. you know, depending on on the volume and the use case, um, you know, we we're always more than happy to uh, to talk to customers about um, the projects. Yeah. So um, this is a one-stop shop in terms of the service element. You guys have increasingly, you're building out your operating system for the physical world, your, your cloud services, um, but you're also bundling in the connectivity. Um, and I'm assuming that you have to work with, you work with different carriers in different parts of the world. How does that work if I'm a if I'm an organization in Europe, if I'm in Germany, say, and I'm in the U.S., um, how does that work? Yeah, so so you know we we want um, our developers and our customers to be you know laser focused on their domain specific application uh, you know um, that is using different IoT elements. Like we don't want them to spend time on you know negotiate negotiating with vendors and carriers. So we 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 do all of that uh, for them. So basically, they they get the device from us, and the device is talking to the cloud. Mm-hmm. That's that's it. Uh, this is as simple as that. And um, and again, this is um, this is not like a standard uh, 3G or LTE um, sort of connectivity. This is like like you mentioned, this is 5G ready uh, connectivity that is um, you know slightly different um, throughput, slightly different uh, bandwidth, slightly different um, you know data plans because we're not talking about like streaming you know gigabytes of data. We're talking about uh, the device that is advertising. Um, its identifier and uh, position, maybe some telemetry data. Um, so, so um, you know, what, what we are excited the most is that um, this is finally the the kind of cloud connected beacon that is wireless and can last multiple years. So, you know, if you want to change something, if you want to, you know, reprogram it, uh, you can always do that, and you you always know where the where the device is, what's the battery status, you know. What is the what is the environment around? So so um, so that is um, you know one one key important element of this architecture. And also, you know, we know from our more, more than five years experience that it simply takes time to design great IoT application and great mobile experience. So you know our objective was to simplify the process. And you know the first beacons we launched. You know, there were uh, really nicely designed tools you could configure um, the range and the transmit power and the eye beacon and everything. But we're talking about a device that has three radios, right? So the UI would be too complex. So we decided to to kind of create sort of like a virtual machine that is, you know, running on top of the device. And then you can use JavaScript, right? So mm-hmm. this is going to open... Uh, this is going to open the IoT world into a completely new community of developers. They they don't need to know C++ and embedded programming. They can just open the browser, you know, open Estimate Cloud. There is a there is an a, a, you know development environment we have created. They can they can build their function. And they want to you know they they, they want the LTE beacon to to execute, and they can they can flash um, that script. And now this device will perform the action. So, you know, it could be simple like if this then that type of application. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, if my forklift has entered the range of that green beacon, I should receive a message about it, right? Or something should happen. So this is all built in JavaScript, and then is executed on, on the uh, on the device. And also, 
you know, when the device is sending the, the data back to the cloud, we also wanted to accelerate the, the data processing uh, part. You know, typically, backend developer uh, would be needed. Uh, he or she has to establish um, some endpoints and um, maybe run an instance on AWS or Heroku. But you know, for a quick prototyping, we we just didn't we didn't want them to to kind of to do all of that just to kind of validate some 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 simple concept. So that's why we also part of this uh, system, we have um, um, something that we call uh, that we call lambda expressions. So basically, it's a it's a piece of it's a piece of JavaScript code that sits on our cloud and is like re- listening for the events to to be received from the device. And then executing them, right? So, for example, you know, if you want to build like a panic button application, so if someone you know touches the button, um, you know, the, the the lambda expression application will, you know, listen for the event when the button was pressed, and as soon as it gets the event, it can connect, for example, to Twilio, or it can send you an email, or it can do something for you. Uh, without you um, hosting a backend application yet, and of course, for more complex projects like um, there's always need for a um, strong data processing. But for simple uh, experiences and a simple proof of concept, mm-hmm. well, this should massively, uh, you know, um, improve the the velocity of the project development of the IoT projects. So. I think what you were saying is that button is programmable, um, and so there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what that can be used for. And if I am doing that, a um, certain amount of back end and on device programming, then all of that is included in this, this service fee. I don't have to worry about setting up uh, an AWS account or anything like that. Um, Absolutely, for the, for, the, for the proof of concepts and simple applications. Mm-hmm. What about battery life? You've got a lot of variables there. It's, it seems like it's almost impossible to give us a battery life because if I write an app that's kind of spinning away, then that's going to use up a lot of battery. If I'm constantly hammering away at the GPS, that, that would use up a lot of battery. What, um, uh, what's your sense? What are you seeing? What, what, what's the kind of range that you expect? What are the, what are the key, key variables and what happens when you run out of battery? Um, yeah, so so the way we would like uh, the community to sort of conceptualize um, the battery usage of this device is that um, we should think about like a certain number of like pings, and the, the ping can be either like a scan, like a radio scan, or like sending some data, right? And and that device, for example, um, could support like two thousand pings, right? So now. It's um it's it's uh, it's the developer to decide. Do you want to send coordinates of your vehicle just once a day? Mm-hmm. Because if you do it once a day, then you're gonna use 360 pings a year, mm-hmm. and that device can last multiple years. Yes. But maybe uh, you wanna send those pings um, every 15 minutes, and of course then the device will um, run out of juice. But the good news is there is a USB. Uh, C uh, slot so we can charge the device again. So this is this is the, the difference between the ordinary beacons that you couldn't charge. So um, so we we don't know yet um, what will be the applications for this device. Uh, we envision some like you know asset tracking, proof of delivery. You know we we see people using these as a beacon gateways, uh, maybe as beacons themselves. But um, but you know we will be um, supporting our developers. Um, with the estimations of uh, how their application will consume the battery, because we have built a very simple um, battery usage profiler part of our cloud. So, so when you are writing your code, you will be able very quickly to sort of estimate and predict if the power consumption is high or it's low. And and also to kind of explain it a little bit more, you know. Programming this device to act as a beacon, well, yeah, that's that's simple and it's inexpensive because the broadcasting the signals, as you guys know from Williot, you know that's the that's the least expensive part of the energy, right? Mm-hmm. Scanning, you know, scanning for the Bluetooth signal, that's a little bit more expensive. Um, uh, then we have the GPS, you know, processing the GPS satellite data, uh, it's a little bit more expensive than Bluetooth scanning. And finally, we have the, the LTE connectivity, 
uh, which is you know the most expensive um, activity of the device, but it's still fraction of the energy that you need for the classic 3G or LTE, right? Because we're talking about completely new protocol, completely new um, technology that has been rolled out in United States, you know, uh, Western Europe and, you know, most of other regions that is uh, going to support all of those IoT applications. Can you explain a, a bit more about those um, uh, low power wide area network protocols? Uh, because this is uh, this is really uh, interesting. What what why did you choose the ones that you did, and what do we need to be aware of in terms of the 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 benefits and the constraints of those protocols that you've chosen? Yeah. So you know, five years ago when we have um, uh, launched. Um, Bluetooth beacons, um, it wasn't standard Bluetooth. It was Bluetooth low energy. It was a slightly modified version of the Bluetooth that enabled the communication, um, but also it was architected um, to, to last much longer on a you know, small battery. The, the way they did that was handling the intervals and the cycle when the device is talking, you know, the phone, to the um, to the beacon, so so it doesn't talk all the time. It doesn't transmit the data all the time. There are specific cycles this can be done, um, and and for some of the applications like um, like you know inner positioning or proximity, this was just enough to have very responsive system and at the same time very scalable system. Because if you don't have to power something, well, you can manufacture tens of thousands of these. Just you know distribute them to your locations and just deploy quickly at scale without you know, installing wires and, and calibration and so on. So this Bluetooth low energy to the classical Bluetooth, this is a very similar analogy to the LTEM and narrowband IoT. These are two different standards to the classical LTE or 3G. So we're talking about completely new protocols that, that have been, um, you know, a couple of years ago uh, ratified by a special group that the same way Bluetooth um, has um, the, the the mobile and cellular world has, mm -hmm. and that and these protocols they just define how the base station that is you know in your neighborhood can listen and talk to those small devices and what should be the cycles what should be the data packets, and again we're talking about small packets uh, containing you know not that much information and also uh, the the packets that uh, that you know the, the base station and the device they agree before what would be the cycle of when they communicate so so it's um you know these the the the, ver the, the two versions of, of that new technology the LTEM and narrowband IoT um, th th there are slight differences in the physics and the frequencies of, of these technologies but um the kind of high level LTEM is more designed for the, you know, the the wearables and the IoT devices that will move, right? So they can move from one station to another, so one base station to another base station. So this could be attached to a truck, and that truck will change the state, change the region, change the district, and the device will hand off, will switch to another base station, will continue the transmission. And um, and and again, you know, the devices can last, you know, multiple years um, uh, using this technology. Um, and then the narrowband IoT, it is more designed for stationary IoT devices. For example, park meter, a smart water meter, um, could be a beacon that is installed and doesn't move. Mm -hmm. So so um, so that technology um, is even even um, even lower power, mm -hmm. and 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 it can. Um, it, it also does support um, uh, more kind of harsh range environments. So, for example, if you put this beacon into your basement mm -hmm. where you typically don't have coverage, mm -hmm. it's going to work, mm -hmm. right? So, so underground uh, parking loft and those mm -hmm. type of uh, places would be supported by the narrowband. And, and, um, and um, there are slight differences, different regions, different countries. They support either one, either second, or both those technologies. So... Uh, we're working with the partners to make sure that there's the right coverage for the right application. And so typically, is it the kind of the big wireless carriers that are providing these networks? Um, and and how uh, how mature is the is the coverage? Um, what should we be uh, expecting in terms of coverage? 
Yeah, so so you remember like five years ago, uh, we asked exactly the same question. We asked the question, you know, how popular are phones with Bluetooth Low Energy, right? And are they already there? <laughs> yeah. Because they, they created the platform. And of course, initially, not all of them supported it. And, and, and we kind of had to wait a little bit. But of course, today, nobody asked the question, you know, every phone we expect and every other device to support BLE. So, 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 you know, our job at Estimo is to kind of search for those emerging technologies and kind of, you know, you know, integrate them when the time, when the timer is right. And, um, and uh, we, we are um, happy to announce that um, those LTEM and narrowband technologies that, you know, U- United States, there's like a 95% of coverage, 95%, they almost the entire nation. And um, most of the Europe is also covered and uh, countries you know, and regions such as, you know, uh, Japan and, and Asia and China and Australia. So, you know, uh, we would expect that uh, within the next uh, 18 months, uh, most of the countries uh, will be covered with either one either the second technology. So um, we, we're really looking forward to, to see how uh, this type of products will also accelerate the innovation that the use cases and the demand uh, from the carriers to 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 turn on the new protocol. The good news is that this new LTEM and narrowband protocols um, they don't require the infrastructure change. So they don't require the base station uh, to be um, you know replaced with a new hardware. In most cases, especially LTEM, this is a software upgrade. So you know if those base stations if they have the existing um, Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, or some other um, vendors, um, you know, infrastructure, you know, they push a button and the base station can be upgraded to support that new type of IoT connectivity. Well, back onto the regular Bluetooth front, uh, what uh, what's the standard that you're supporting? What kind of signal strength can we get out of uh, the beacon? Yeah, so we have decided to put into this uh, new device um, um, the the latest one of the best um, uh, Bluetooth chips. Uh, So uh, we are fully support uh, Bluetooth 5 uh, with all the features such as mesh networking, um, you know, long range, um, high high, uh, throughput of data. Uh, so um, that it does include the the, the, the Bluetooth mesh networking. Um, uh, that is um, something in addition to the kind of low power mesh we we had at Estimo. mode. Um, and also um, uh, we're gonna put a um, plus 20 dB am- amplifier. So we also expect that the device uh, will be able to either um, um, burst uh, the energy to to power you know for example Willio devices mm-hmm. uh, if that's needed, but also broadcast long-range packets for some of the applications as well. That's fantastic. So uh, let's wrap up, but uh, just uh, end with, say, what's the top three um, kind of sweet spot use cases? You've, you've referenced a, a few, but where are you seeing the most interest, the biggest opportunities? Um, you know, we, we encourage to, um, to the developers to think about this new, this new device as a sort of... Um, Prototyping tool for uh, for their for their you know IoT applications the same way that when we launched these beacons we knew that the smaller you know uh, less expensive beacons and eventually you know passive beacons will mm-hmm. come right mm-hmm. and, and 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 that is the kind of uh, idea behind this this device that whatever the software is that the developers will create for this device. It is going. It is going to work on much smaller um, versions that will come uh, in the future. Mm-hmm. And you know the applications we've seen from the standard asset tracking applications. What we are excited a lot is the um, the sort of panic button application. Mm-hmm. So it's an application where uh, where people can um, have similar device with them mm-hmm. uh, indoors, mm-hmm. and whenever they push the button. Uh, the the device will scan for the nearby beacons, mm-hmm. will consume and calculate the indoor position, and then using the LTEM network will send that indoor position to the cloud. Mm-hmm. So so we expect that this will have a lot of applications in hospitality and uh, and some other sectors. Um, but um, as as we as we talked before, you know. With beacons, there were some applications we didn't expect, and we've seen everything. We've seen beacons attached to chickens, and quadcopters for size landing, and you know beacons on the oil platforms, and so on. So we're extremely excited to see 
what kind of applications developers will uh, will create with this new device? And I think you're going to see a bunch. It seems like the, um, and I think it's in your um, in your blog post that's uh, coming out around about now. Um, this tracking of very high value assets, where you have to have a multimodal situation, where you can be switching from tracking it outdoors, tracking it indoors. It seems the ability to to be using GPS on the road and then using uh, beacons inside to see where that aircraft engine is or some high value item like that. That seems great. I love the fact that this can be a gateway for other tags, um, seeing it in, in vans and trucks and then monitoring what's in the van and the truck and cold chain. I think the possibilities are endless. So it's going to be really exciting to see what people uh, come up with. Jacob, thanks so much for sharing this with us. It's great to be uh, one of the first getting the lowdown on your device. I think it's super exciting. I congratulate you. Always really enjoy these conversations. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, looking forward to uh, connect more and then see, you know, um, where the industry is going. Very good. All the best. Thank you so much. Take care.